We're thinking big tonight in the living markets. Ahead of the St. Gallen Symposium next week, we're asking how the leaders of tomorrow feel about their future career plans. A special panel discussion is coming up tonight with the CEO of IKEA Switzerland. Friday's here and so is that weekend feeling. We've got your weekly wrap of culture, arts and movies in tonight's big picture. And a bit of this guy coming your way. What more could you want in the working week? And also on the Newsmaker, a white paper on blockchain. Eva Kiley is a member of the European Parliament and tonight she tells us that Switzerland has an important part to play in the evolution of this important technology. It's one of the countries we are working very closely and um, I do believe that we have a lot to learn. So, from Switzerland yes, or from, from each other? Switzerland. And I think we can... Uh, what sort of things could you learn? Well, for example, you have a system, uh, an electoral system that's working. You have the referendums where people participate more. We don't have that in Europe, actually. So you educate your citizens in many different things so that they can make decisions. Good evening, you're watching The Swiss Pulse. I'm Hannah Wise. Welcome to The Living Markets. It's a packed day of news and special interviews for you tonight. So let's get started. the 27th of April. Welcome to the Swiss Pulse. I'm Hannah Wise and let's kick off tonight with the main news headlines. Setting the stage for a very interesting time in Swiss politics, the current economic minister Johann Schneider Amann has announced he'll stand down. In an interview with the NZZ, the 66-year-old said he would not be standing for re-election at the end of 2019. It's an opportunity for the Federal Council to shake things up in the future. Doris Leuthard, the former president, had also previously announced she'll be stepping down at the end of the term as well. Thomas Jordan, the chairman of the Swiss National Bank, has given his thoughts this Friday on the sovereign money referendum, saying it would bring great uncertainty. The initiative aims to prevent commercial banks from creating money electronically, meaning the SNB would be the only ones who could do so. Swiss people will vote on the issue on June the 10th. Speaking today, Jordan also said that the Swiss franc is still highly valued, but a weaker franc is a welcome relief for the economy. Swiss bank Raiffeisen is seeing a massive shake-up at its highest level. Six out of 11 directors are quitting. The bank hasn't revealed any details surrounding the departures, but Raiffeisen is in the midst of a scandal relating back to the bank's former CEO, Pierre M. Vincenz. Now, Vincenz is currently in jail while authorities investigate what they suspect is a series of bad faith deals. Giving peace a chance, Kim Jong-un became the first North Korean leader to cross the border to the south today in a watershed breakthrough in the nuclear-armed peninsula. They agreed to declare an end to the war this year and to aim for complete denuclearization. De Meanwhile, Bern issued a statement recognising the historic nature of the summit. The Federal Council added that Switzerland is, quote, convinced nuclear and security issues on the peninsula can only be resolved via an inclusive diplomatic process. We'll have much more on this historic meeting later tonight on The Big Picture. Well, meanwhile, US President Donald Trump hosts yet another world leader this Friday after French President Emmanuel Macron's visit to Washington this week failed to convince Mr Trump to change his mind on the Iran deal. German leader Angela Merkel gets her chance and maybe also steer him away from trade war with Europe. There won't be a red carpet rollout for Merkel, however, just a 20-minute Oval Office meeting, lunch and a half-hour news conference. But her mission is the same to get Mr Trump to re-engage with Europe and the world. All right, coming up, a wrap of the week's markets. That's coming up in the market summary after the break with the weather.
CNN Money Switzerland weather, we start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the radar animation of the last 90 minutes. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland. And south of the Alps. Thanks for following. Welcome back to The Living Markets. I'm Hannah Wise. Let's get you the roundup of the main market news now. And despite strong results from Facebook yesterday, markets in the United States are treading a little more carefully today. That's owed to a mixed bag of earnings. Now, the hits are from Microsoft and Amazon, which have more than doubled their profits, but a miss from the world's largest publicly traded oil and gas company, ExxonMobil. And it might look like a good day for the food state today, as you can see, but Britain's economy is, in fact, slowing right down. The UK economy is seeing one of its weakest periods of GDP growth, up a meagre 0.1% in the first quarter of this year. Now, as we mentioned, that Amazon continues to be the talk of the town today. And there's good reason for that. The world's largest on online retailer saw shares jump 7% after predicting a strong spring forecast. Now, that's a record high that's going to add an extra $8 billion to CEO Jeff Bezos's net worth. And if you're watching from the United States uh, tonight, you'll soon see a hike in your Amazon Prime membership from $99 to $119 a year. Share price up over 5%. Zooming in on Europe now today, automotive company Renault dragged the CAC 40 down in France. It fell short of analysts' expectations with revenues up by just 0.2% in the first quarter. The French car maker saw disappointing sales from China, India and South Korea. The loss is owing to the stronger euro, which has gone up 11% against the dollar in the last year, you can see their Renault down by nearly 3%. Let's bring you back home now. Today, the SMI wrapping up the day, oh, slightly up, just in the green there. But remember a small world? Well, yesterday, we told you that the Swiss social network operator saw a huge dip, nearly dropping 40% at its lowest point. That was after an investigation by the German financial watchdog into potential manipulation of its shares. Well, today, as you can see, it posted a huge turnaround, up by nearly 26%. The company released a statement saying that the investigation was not focused on them, but on third parties. And that's you, all up to date. Well, joining me now, I'm delighted to say, is Costa Vinyenas. I hope I pronounced that right. Almost. We practiced, yes. didn't yes. we? Yes. And I've, I've gone and fluffed it. Senior consultant at Willershoff Partners. We've got a lot to talk about. Let's start small here in Switzerland uh, and see how far we get. The SMB chair, Thomas Jordan, saying today that the weakening of the Swiss franc is, is really just it normalizing. Would you agree? Uh, on, on the one hand, yes. Um, I think it's, it's useful to get a sense of where the Swiss franc should trade in terms of its purchasing power parity, and that's around one Swiss franc 22 against the euro. Mm -hmm. um, we're very close to that, so that would place the currency in fair value. Um, against the dollar, it should be 95 US cents against the Swiss franc. 
Today we were at 98, so we're very close to that. So, um, Do you think we'll see it continuing to weaken? Uh, against the euro, probably yes, for the simple reason that uh, Europe is doing relatively well, um, and probably yes. And what does that mean in terms of everyday life here in Switzerland? Well, um, it means that uh, imported goods uh, become more expensive. The currency is weakened by 10% against the euro over the past year. Um, and you can already see that in terms of inflation. Mm -hmm. Import inflation is up 2% year on year. Uh, and he also was saying that, you know, any tightening of the monetary policy would be too early at, at this juncture. So, um, I mean, the view I would take is that central banks typically have to be data dependent. Uh, they look at the same numbers that we do. Mm -hmm. Um, the most recent economic growth numbers... So you have to understand, the Swiss economy can potentially grow at around 1.5%. Mm -hmm. That's potential growth. Uh, it's now growing uh, at around 2% um, or more. So it's growing above potential, and that would be unusual to leave interest rates where they are now. So you think he could change his mind? Oh, yes, at any time. Uh, what, in, in the next weeks, do you think? Or, no, no, I mean, no, no. Most people no, that we saying... speak to are just saying that, you know, the, the SMB aren't going to do very much before the ECB does. Um, that may or may not happen. Um, if you've seen the currency weaken by 10% over the past year, uh, if the currency were to weaken by a lot more unexpectedly, um, the central bank would have to reassess. So the SMB is data dependent. In a growing economy, things have to change. How long do you think we could see negative interest rates? Um, well, that's difficult to say. Um, the, one of the key measures is to look at inflation. Inflation is just below 1%. Um, so at this pace, they still have time to wait. Um, but I wouldn't want to you know, put a specific date on it because I couldn't possibly mm. predict that. All right, let me put this to you then. The US Treasury mentioned that Switzerland uh, could be a possible currency manipulator. What do you make of that? Yeah, so the, 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 the US Treasury uh, was instructed by Congress uh, to monitor uh, various countries. Switzerland is on that list because uh, it has a very large current account uh, surplus and because uh, reserves have built up very significantly. So this, in a way, ties the central bank's hands um, in the sense that it shouldn't be intervening excessively uh, if it doesn't want to attract attention. So it's something, it's something worth watching. Do you think that the SMB is uh, transparent enough? Um, we don't get sufficient data fast enough in some cases. Mm. Um, it takes some time to do that. Um, but I think on the whole, yes. I'm just wondering if, you know, the, the United States has a point. You know, could we be uh, more yes. open? So, so in the last, in the last uh, US Treasury report, they specifically stated that they would appreciate uh, the Swiss National Bank uh, releasing more information earlier. Uh, we talked about the ECB very briefly a minute yeah. ago. Let's kind of broaden out our discussion to in involve the rest of Europe. Mario Draghi saying that, you know, he's going to keep his policies the same. Were you surprised by that? Um, no, because what he was doing, he was describing data that we had seen. So as I mentioned, we typically have similar data. Mm. He described um, that the first quarter numbers that we saw in Europe were weaker. Um, so he merely repeated what, what was observable, and therefore that was not too much of a surprise. Sometimes the markets try to read a, a huge amount into a particular uh, comment, mm -hmm. um, and I'd say that's not always useful. So, for example, today we had um, data out of Europe showing that April, uh, April uh, sentiment indicators had moved sideways mm -hmm. better than the information that Draghi had earlier in the week. So I wouldn't read too much uh, into some of those statements. Do you think the European economy will slow? So the European, I think it's worth knowing what Europe, Europe Eurozone's potential growth rate uh, is around 1.1%. Um, it's currently growing at somewhere 
around two and a half to three. So Europe is growing way above its potential um, and therefore it's not unexpected to see a bit of weakness, a bit of slowdown, but it's still, these are still good numbers. Anywhere in particular in Europe that we might see more of a slowdown? Um, well, the expectation would be that you might see more of this uh, uh, in, in Germany, but these would be shorter term fluctuations. The general, the general numbers that we have, the outlook that we have, suggest that Europe is doing relatively well. Okay. And, and the recent slowdown should not be over-exaggerated. Let's uh, go out even further now. Let's involve the United States. Um, the picture there is very different. GDP today shows a slowdown, however. Uh, what happened? Um, so again, I, I think it's worth knowing growth relative to what. So uh, we estimate the potential growth uh, possibility for the US economy around 1.9%. That's mm -hmm. the potential for the economy. Um, and today, annualized growth was around 24 if you look at year-on-year -year numbers, it was 2.9. So the US is doing extremely well relative to what it can do. Um, and again, um, I know the market's sort of focused on annualized, an annualized decline uh, this quarter with the previous quarter. But if you look at year-on-year -year numbers, it still looks pretty good. And I mean, are there any challenges that come with, with an economy that's doing better than expected? Yes. So the first, the first is uh, you begin running out of people. Um, and that's what we have in uh, there are more and more news reports uh, about um, uh, companies, regions looking for, uh, for workers in certain categories. Mm -hmm. um, that's a nice problem to have. Um, but quite oh, a serious problem when you're kind of focusing on regenerating business at home. Yes, but, um, you know, there are things that can be done with that. That's a nice <laughs> problem to have. Um, and the other, the other problem would be inflation. Um, inflation in the U.S. is around 2.5%. So um, over time, inflation is likely to pick up then if you, if you have an economy that's growing well above potential. And, of course, the other, the other challenge is, you know, you cannot grow sustainably above what your potential is, so you get closer to the next recession. And how do kind of these inflation worries and the slowdown, how do they go together? So, um, well, the, typically what happens and what has happened in the past is inflation has always kind of triggered the central bank to raise rates mm -hmm. uh, and trigger a recession. Um, that may or may not happen this time. But I think that inflation is obviously something that we have to watch for it very closely. Are we in closely. uncharted territory, really, with kind of how things are developing in the United States? Or... Well, we... In uncharted territory, in terms of debt, mm -hmm. the U.S. has never had as much debt, uh, government debt, as it has now. It has debt to GDP, similar levels to the Second World War. So that's uncharted. Um, what is also uncharted is that you have, this late in the cycle, um, huge deficits, um, tax cuts. We like ta tax cuts, um, but they've got to be paid for at some point. So that is unusual. OK. Well, well we've run out of time. Uh, Costa Vayanas, thank you very much thank indeed you. for joining us. Thank you. Much more to come here on The Living Markets. First, though, a look at your foreign currency exchange tonight with Swiss Gold. Welcome back. You are watching Friday's Living Markets. I'm joined now live from Geneva 
by Roberto Magnatantini, Head of Global Equities at CIS Asset Management. Welcome to the programme. Let's talk tech, Amazon and Facebook, quite the turnaround. Yeah, well, we cannot really say that it's a turnaround because they really never left the party. I mean, uh, the, those companies have been in the driving seat of the bull market over the last two years. And uh, we can find negatives to the tech story, but for sure, earnings have been really quite impressive. Today's results at Amazon are really best of breed. You can consider that it's a company that is very close to $800 billion uh, market capitalization. So it's, it dwarfs entire countries like, well, Italy or uh, Spain or even Russia probably today. So we have this type of very large company and it's growing at a rate that could have even blush out of pride startups. So it's really, it's not out of, uh, of the blue that these companies uh, are performing so well. So I was going to these... ask you, I mean, what is the mood like then for tech stocks? I guess they, it never really dipped at all. Yeah, we, we had this, this issue with Facebook. We had this uh, data leak at Facebook. It was probably a little bit of the, the first serious scare uh, of these bull markets, because as we said, earnings are, are good. So the, the big question for technology probably today is, is it too good to last? So do we have to, to fear uh, regulation, for example, or increased taxation? And Facebook gives us a, a, a hint of the risk that we could face. But uh, yeah, I agree. We uh, should, and you think it is going to, I mean, how long is it going to last? I would love to answer that. <laughs> but uh, now, what is true is that today, today we have companies that have become almost natural monopolies. And because of that, even if they have created massive wealth and, and uh, also uh, almost for free added services to the people, we have companies that have very few employees. Maybe Amazon is a little bit the exception, but uh, Facebook is something like 20,000 employees and they generate billions in profits and they do not pay that much in terms of taxes. So it, it's relatively easy to consider that they could attract uh, yeah, stronger regulation, tougher regulation, and that could be the first serious test of the, of the bull market. Because all right, well, with, all with, all, with all this positivity about uh, surrounding tech stocks, you know, how come then that US stocks you know, have been struggling? Yeah, well, they've been struggling after a, a massive run. So we shouldn't forget wh where we're coming from. The US, over the last couple of years, the S&P went up roughly 40, 50 percent, uh, almost unabated. We had very few corrections. So probably we had, uh, yeah, we, we were at a state where some complacency was built in the system and you were poised to have a correction. So we had the situation when earnings were very strong, economics were relatively strong, but you had interest rates going up and interest rates um, yeah, they act very much like a sort of gravitational force for the markets. So you have to do even better uh, than you, what you were doing with lower rates just to stand still. And even if we do not think there is a, a bubble in technology stocks, they are quite expensive. The FANGs and e-commerce stocks, they are quite expensive. They, they are long duration stocks, so they're very sensitive to interest rates. Let's talk about bond yields then for a moment. They're currently sitting around 3%. Uh, this is one reason perhaps investors aren't going into a uh, market. So how do you see that bond situation developing? Yeah, no, that's definitely something that we, we watch very closely. There are two situations. If interest rates go up because the economics are improving faster than what was initially expected, it's a relatively benign scenario. The situation today is probably a bit more worrying because we have these interest rates going up. We went from 2.5 to 3 since the beginning of the year for the 10-year uh, US uh, bond. And probably with economics that are a little bit on the weakish side, so we, there is this fear that it's more the quantitative easing receding than really the strength in the economy. So, yeah, we personally think that it's quite unlikely that we go much higher than 3% in the short term. You think because we'll it's reach 3.5%? That's what we're hearing. Technic everybody's looking at the same technical levels, and uh, that's a level that is quite obvious. So there may be some self-fulfilling uh, into that. But we would be quite surprised, because bottoming processes take years. They are not as fast as that to, uh, to happen. And again, the strength in the economy is not 
uh, is not sufficient probably today to go much above 3, 2, 3, 3, something like that. We saw today the economic numbers weren't as impressive today. Again. Okay, let's just uh, quickly move on to Europe. We're running out of time, but you know the strengthening euro is also posing problems here. Who are, what are some of the companies that uh, are being hardest hit? Companies that have the highest, um, yeah, co companies that have only translation risk, meaning that they they have a cost base that is matching the revenue base, are relatively sheltered. Those that are more exposed are ones that produce in Europe and export directly everything into uh, into other currency. Clearly, here you have transactional cost. It's it's more an issue. But we have Switzerland, we have Germany as examples. Companies tend to adapt quite well in the long run. So strong a strong currency for a country and even for a company in the long run is not such a big issue. If you are in a low added value uh, industry, clearly that's more a problem. Okay, well, we'll leave it there, uh, Mr. Manian Tantini. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on CNN Money Switzerland. All right, we're going to move on to some sports news now. And there's been a bucket load of drama so far in this year's Formula One season. And this weekend promises yet more. Narrow corners and a long straight will keep drivers on their toes when they return to Baku City Circuit in Azerbaijan. Before practice got underway, however, CNN's Amanda Davies asked the drivers what their dream circuit could look like. If you could put a circuit anywhere in the world, where would you put it? In my hometown, you know, in the north of Spain, beautiful. I think I would put it in Denmark um, to have a home race. New Zealand. Okay. Um, very far away. I would put it between a part in Switzerland and a part in France, you know, yeah. as I'm, I'm a Swiss are French. So. Yeah, that's a good question. I would probably put it in Miami. So what would it look like? Just. Let's try. Ooh. It's actually very hard. I'd start with, with a main straight, which obviously isn't going to be straight because we don't like straights. Yeah, let, let's get a straight line, that's fairly easy. And a big hairpin, so you've got some good overtaking maneuver. Half oval. <laughs> we recognize that. An Indianapolis uh, and inspiration. I'd probably go for a mix of some of the nice corners on the Formula One calendar. This could be the most dizzy circuit that you're ever going to find. A massive elevation where at the bottom it's, it's fully dry, and then as you go up, okay. you you know, get to snow. Just doing something completely crazy here. Uh, we can take a rouge. A rouge. And uh, would you have the, the big uh, hill as well? Yes. You'd make, yeah? Yes, definitely. Uh, we, we're going back down to the lake. Okay. Uh, let's so put the... the lake? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some fish. Down this whole strip, there needs to just be... This would be the, the garages on this side with a view over to the beach. Tight herping. More or less like Austin also in 10 one probably here I imagine going uphill and, uh, you know, start the corner and then it closes up. We probably need another heaven just to have a bit of space. <laughs> Come out of here and then you go into a banked curve, then into a chicane. And very long circuit. I love long circuits, long laps. So lap that takes four or five minutes, so maybe, I don't know, 15 k's. Okay. Circuit. So where is the best vantage point for watching, do you think? Yeah, with 15 Ks, you yeah. can put uh, millions of people, you know, in the ground and stand around. You see quite a lot here. <laughs> <on> the... <laughs> the top of the mountain. I like it. And do we have a, a Kevin Magnuson stand or a Kevin Magnuson corner? Or... They would just be everywhere around the track. <laughs> the whole track. <laughs> uh, so do, do you think it's got a realistic chance of making it onto the calendar? No. Absolutely not. I have no hope, because I don't think it would be technically possible. Project for... Which, yeah, what year will we see it? 2023. 20, awesome. Five years' time. The, the long roller coaster, I think this could be, you know, the, it, goes, it goes up. Up. My mum is an artist if she sees <laughs> this, she's going to kill me. <laughs> well, meanwhile, if you fancy a taste of the Formula One life, and of course you have a spare 285,000 US dollars, well, you can buy McLaren's street legal 720S from this May. McLaren's most opulent car to date debuted at the Geneva Motor Show in March. Now, back then, I caught a sneak peek. 
but my colleague Peter Valdez de Pina took it for a test drive. McLaren, beautifully designed, fast, and surprisingly refined. Racing fans will know McLaren as a dominating force on the circuit. And what do you get when a 182-time Formula One winner makes road cars? You get something very special. You know, with a car like this, what you really want is big, wide open spaces. Around here, this is about as good as it gets. Somehow they managed to get 710 horsepower out of a four liter V8. I mean, there's turbochargers, but still that's a lot. It makes for a very light car. The end result is something like this. Really quick. And it stops really fast. If you don't have a track or can't find a 14,000 space parking lot like this one, McLaren cars are still a blast on ordinary roads. Crushing acceleration, scalpel sharp steering, but still friendly. This one's all race tracked out. I've got sports racing seats that don't adjust hardly at all. I've got big carbon fiber ceramic brakes. Considering what this thing is capable of, the 720S is actually a fairly well-mannered car. Which is what you would expect from a British supercar. Cool looking and fast, but really nothing improper. All right, stay with us here on the Swiss Pulse tonight. Ahead of the St. Gallen Symposium next week, we're joined by a panel of guests, including the CEO of IKEA Switzerland, to discuss the motivations driving young workers today. That's with Martina Folks after this break. Welcome to our special segment tonight on the upcoming 48th St. Gallen Symposium, which will take place next week from May the 2nd to the 4th, focusing on the theme Beyond the End of Work. The St. Gallen Symposium just released the Global Perspectives Barometer 2018 today, and the study was conducted this February in English in cooperation with the GFK Verein with a total of 1,400 leaders of tomorrow participating in the online survey. Well, leaders of tomorrow are promising global young talent selected by the symposium each year. 200 academics, politicians, entrepreneurs and professionals of around 30 years or younger are invited. So what are the key findings? Well, the key outcomes are that the leaders of tomorrow have a very optimistic view when it comes to the future of work. 53% are even excited about their future careers, seeing a world of possibility. But interestingly, the next generation of leaders primarily looks for intrinsic motivation at work. Many of the participants expect their work life to be interesting. They want a change, to and contribute to society or to learn new things. They think that work should offer a good salary, a lot of autonomy and a chance to work with interesting people around them. But traditional motivation factors seem to have lost meaning for the surveyed top talent. Employee benefits and job security land on the last rank. And another interesting finding we have to discuss tonight, leaders of tomorrow prefer being an expert or an entrepreneur over being a top level executive. And uh, joining me now to discuss all these issues is uh, Ms. Uh, Simona Scarpaleccia. She is uh, the CEO and country manager at IKEA sitting next to me. Then we have uh, Mr. Raphael Schad. He is a entrepreneur and innovation coach. And here on my right is Mr. Kaspar Kachli. He is from the University of St. Gallen, a project manager who has worked on this study. Now, Ms. Skarpaleccia, let me start with you. Are you surprised by the findings of this study? Uh, 
Well, being a mother of three, who are more or less of the age of those who replied, not really, uh, for some reasons. Uh, uh, the optimism is fundamental, it's really good news, and the curiosity for the new technologies is there. And I see it at home, but I see it also at IKEA with our co-workers, the young generations. Raphael, you are of this young generation that uh, Ms. Carpaleccia mentions. Do you agree with what she's saying? And uh, what has been some of the surprise, you know, effect from that study for you? Sure, yeah, I, I do share the uh, optimism. Um, and one of the things that was uh, kind of surprising that you touched on uh, previously was um, that a lot of the young people, they want to become an entrepreneur or kind of like forge. Like you are. For, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, you're living your dream, basically. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to kind of do what I uh, want to do, but it's also a very uncertain path. It's also a path with a lot of hard work. Um, and I think the main kind of thing that we can take away from that is perhaps that the current young generation is a little bit less um, focused on climbing existing structures and rather kind of build their own structures, even though they might be a little bit smaller. Kaspar, uh, you have worked with a lot of leaders of tomorrow at the uh, St. Gallen Symposium, where Raphael and I were actually also leaders of uh, tomorrow in 2017. There seems to be an incredible amount of optimism, almost a little bit, hmm, shall I say, naive, maybe? What do you think? What do you feel when you talk to these uh, survey participants? Why are they so bullish on their work future? Right. Uh, while looking at our sample, we consider a lot of ambitious students and young entrepreneurs, and there's a strong belief in technology. And that is due to the immense progress we've seen in the last 20 to 30 re re uh, years. Um, but we can also see the challenges we face. So 69% of our respondents said there's inequality on the rise. So they see that inequality in terms of wages, but also opportunities. So we really need to make sure as a society that we have equal opportunities um, for everyone. And the third point I would like to make is really the unique sample we have of ambitious students, young entrepreneurs, young politicians, and they are really working with this technology. So this result isn't a real surprise because they're working with it and benefit directly. It from seems it. that they really want to be, you know, excited about the job and. What is surprising to me is that actually the salary level is not important anymore. Like cash doesn't count, but really that much anymore, but really to have a purpose and a meaning in your job. Is this what you're sensing when you talk to these young talents? I think so, yeah. I think every human being has this sense of drive in itself to really make a positive impact on the, on the world. Uh, and therefore, that's like a logical result. We can, we can see that. And also the importance of work is growing in terms of our identity, but also um, in our role as a society. So that's what Ms. Carpaleccia, you are a top level executive here in Switzerland. On top of that, a woman. Now, it looks like a lot of the young people here do not want to become CEOs anymore. Is it you know, difficult for you to find staff and the recruitment process to join a big company like IKEA? What I see is that the search for a purpose is absolutely uh, very, very positive. And for instance, we work in a very traditional sector, retail. Uh, but what we want to propose is uh, we are not simply selling furniture. We are improving people's lives. And it changes completely the perspective. And you can be a super technological expert. You can be uh, the person who consults the customers in, um, in the furnishing the home. But you improve their lives, and this is the purpose. So if we play that, we can really have uh, nice people. It must be a challenge, though, for big multinationals uh, like IKEA to give a purpose to the employee to make sure that still there is enough career development, promotion, so that they can have this sense of purpose and meaning. Otherwise, they might get frustrated, the young people, well, very I soon. Think it, I found very interesting what you said. Um, uh, the, the world of work is changing a lot, and this pyramid model is not valid anymore. So I, I think we should forget about having this escalation to the CEO, but working and making an impact. We are working more and more in groups, in task force, uh, uh, and, and what you will realize is what gives satisfaction. We have seen uh, in the survey uh, that you mentioned, uh, Raphael, that about 98% of the participants, they would use the help of AI for organizing workflows and processes. So really automation AI is key. You're also an innovation coach. 
how do you embed that and what do you tell the young people you know who are eager to study and learn more about AI and automation and want to implement that in their work too? Sure, yeah. I mean, um, AI right now is a very hot topic. And what I basically do is I, I kind of studied um, how can humans and machines work together optimally. So I don't think it's about replacing humans by uh, robots, uh, kind of, you know, the, replacing the muscle, or algorithms re replacing kind of our intellectual skills. Um, I really think that it's kind of a, a, a concert, working concert, humans and machines together. Um, but I also understand kind of fear from some of the people, as we heard uh, at the beginning of this conversation from Kaspar, this is not necessarily a representative study. Um, I think most people that were surveyed, they actually um, will benefit from kind of amplifying their, their workflow. And I understand if uh, some people actually fear change and they are, are, are kind of fearing, depending on how, how and where they work, um, that they might be replaced. And so um, what I'm really concerned about is kind of designing the interface between the humans and how we actually use these new technologies and kind of leverage the machines as opposed to sort of the other way around. At your company, Ms. Carpaleccia, how do you train staff, you know, as a huge retail and manufacturing company to not be scared of yeah. the new technologies and the robots yeah. that are coming? I believe we as a company, we do have a responsibility to look ahead and see what uh, can happen and support all of us because this will touch all of us. We need to unlearn relearn and uh, upskill ourselves continuously, most probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, by uh, removing the fears uh, about this renewal and, and bringing the positive impact of the renewal, we can really move the company and the people in a better place. Kaspar, you have been a student at the University of St. Gallen and are now the project manager for this uh, Global uh, Perspectives uh, Barometer 2018. What are some of the fears that you still have? Because you didn't graduate that long ago and you might still be, you know, uh, concerned by some of the things that Ms. Skarbaleccia is saying, the new wave of robots and AI and drones and blockchain and cryptocurrencies. What are, what are some of the worries for you? Right, so I'm actually still in kind of the university phase, so I'm not graduated yet. Um, but I think the fears are really the, the kind of social contract which needs to hold, really to have to give everybody the same opportunity we can and to really make sure that everybody finds a job he's really uh, he can work into, into a field he's passionate about, which is important, and, and the outcomes will be, will be so there if he can do that. So once you graduate, once you do, what do you want to do afterwards? That's a, that's a fascinating Are question. Are you more the traditional kind, you know, who looks for financial stability, job security, or are you more the freedom seeker that we have seen in this study who wants to be independent and maybe start a startup company? Right, to be honest, I, I think it has to be something like of both things, <laughs> um, which is hard to find, but really have the freedom to work on a, on a topic you're passionate about, to be like a, like a thought leader in that, but also to have some kind of stability because our study showed that um, to have to make a living is still an important thing um, people look for, obviously, in doing a job. Maybe. You have gone exactly yeah, exact speak, to that, <laughs> Rafi. Speak to that. Um, it's, uh, it's fascinating what, what Karsh was mentioning here. Kind of, you kind of want to have the best of both worlds, Give it us seems. a little bit of background um, because you went the other way, really not going for security and stability, but you actually went to Silicon Valley, had your projects there, studied at the MIT. You're more of the new generation startup entrepreneur, isn't it? Uh, perhaps, yeah. Um, and and it, I recently returned back to Switzerland. I, I love it here. Um, uh, but I did venture out and uh, learn, learned a lot. I worked um, for four and a half years in Silicon Valley and did the whole startup thing there. Um, and, and I studied at M MIT. Um, but uh, I think now back, I also kind of need to find this balance that Cosper is talking about. On one hand, I'm back here to start a startup, start a company, and kind of be the CEO of you know something uh, maybe smaller than than IKEA or an existing company. So, what has um, been your intrinsic motivation? Is it to start something new, to be a pioneer, or just you didn't fit into any of these big company formats and frameworks? Well, it, it almost seems that I actually still 
kind of do and also have to. So um, uh, on, on the other hand, I do uh, consult for big and existing companies, right? They do have working businesses and products, so I respect that highly. So I'm kind of trying to uh, do both in both worlds. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, an, it's an interesting, uh, interesting challenge. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm respecting existing companies a lot. And I think it was also really fascinating what you said at the very beginning, um, how IKEA is kind of looking into a distributed model. And, um, and you can also find ownership, uh, not just by starting a company, but maybe by you know, running, kind of uh, owning the, the, the sort of trajectory of a, a team or a product and being given responsibility within a bigger company. There are so many new business models, right? But also the environment, regulatory, political, social, financial has to be right. Do you think, uh, Ms. Carvalecha, that Switzerland offers enough in terms of future of work and for young people to find what they're looking for? Well, what I can see is that Switzerland is very interested in this topic. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very innovative country. It's uh, up on Maybe all the rankings. Maybe less than Sweden and other yes, Scandinavian yes, nations. It's, it's up in the rankings and uh, there is a collective effort to understand the phenomena and, and facilitate that. And I value that very positively. How important is, for example, a platform, Kaspar, like the St. Gallen Symposium, you know, to offer young people new perspectives, uh, new insights, and also the networking to the big shots of different industries? I think that's a unique opportunity, the St. Gallen Symposium. It brings together this year three generations of people to really uh, bring their perspective on a, on a big stage. As you mentioned, with talking to Mrs. Scarpa Lecher, it's a unique opportunity for a student. And we had, we had some amazing stories happening at the symposium, with, which had impacted many, many people. And I think uh, we'll, we'll still do. As you mentioned, there will be three generations of business right. leaders. What are some of the things that you think, as a young student, you can still learn from the older generation? Is it the discipline or the focus or you know, financial security? What can you I learn think, from them? I think it's two things. One is taking responsibility and being ready at the moment when you need to be ready. I think that- Be at the right time, right. at the right place. This right. is what my grandfather also always <laughs> said. So this is two generations away, but this is definitely something I could learn. I would still really emphasize that, yeah. Good. So um, for Rafi, what are your plans now? I mean, talking about the future of work and career plans, um, do you want to settle at some point and, and have more employees in your startup uh, environment? Or do you want to stay you know, as free as possible? A free sure. man. Yeah, no, no, I'm really interested in, uh, in, in building something that can have a, an impact on, on society. And so the best work I've always done was in teams. Um, so eventually, I don't want to just be a, a one person uh, show, but really, um, work with with uh, motivated and, and brilliant people um, and so uh, hopefully you know if uh, I get there and, and un until then I already work with you know very brilliant people um, from from bigger companies and I'm excited to go and debate at this year's uh, symposium with the current leaders um, uh, of today about you know kind of how the future of work might shape up shape up and and where sort of the, the respective roles are Ms. Karpalecha, now you're also going to the uh, St. Gallen Symposium. What is your advice to these young people in terms of work ethics and also in terms of their you know, future dreams, what they want to uh, become and how they can fulfill those? Well, if I can say two things. The first one, creativity is so important. So don't give it up. Don't be framed. I mean, we, we, it's so easy to be framed. So it built on that. And the other thing also, praise imperfection. These machines are fantastic. They can work fantastically well. You can partner, let's say, with machines. But imperfection is so human and so warm. It's so beautiful. So don't freak out if you make some mistakes. It's so Nothing nice. Nothing is perfect, that's for Pretty sure. Nice. So last word to my man from the uh, St. Gallen Symposium, <laughs> Kaspar. What are your expectations in a couple of words uh, for the uh, 48th St. Gallen Symposium starting next Wednesday to Friday? Right. I, I really hope for healthy discussion, really openly debate about the issues we face as a society, as a world, as business leaders um, like Mrs. Scarpaleccia and really have this debate um, be open about everything and kind of bring that little, little change to the world that might be needed. And hopefully most of us can have a job that makes them feel happy. Thank you so much to my exciting, 
panel of guests, uh, Ms. Karpoletja from IKEA, Mr. Uh, Schad, who is an entrepreneur and innovator, and Kaspar Köchli from the uh, St. Gallen Symposium. Thank you very much. And that's 840 Living Markets and our special vertical on the upcoming 48th St. Gallen Symposium on the topic that we said beyond the future of work. CNN Money Switzerland will be there from Wednesday to Friday next week with special interviews and coverage. You don't want to miss it. We are taking a short break now and we'll see you after that for our big picture. Thanks God, it's Friday. I'm Martina Fuchs. Don't go away. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland Weekend Weather, starting with Saturday. And here are the comfort indexes for the Swiss cities. Let's have a look for Saturday in Europe. the comfort indexes for some cities. Let's go to Sunday in Switzerland. And here are the comfort indexes. Discover the more attractive cities based on the weather. Friday is finally here and so is that weekend feeling. You know what I'm talking about. We've got your weekly wrap up of culture, arts and movies. And a bit of this guy coming your way. What more could you want to end the work with, week with? I don't know. A white paper on blockchain. Eva Kyle is a member of the European Parliament and tonight she tells us that Switzerland has an important part to play in the evolution of this important technology. It's one of the countries we are working very closely and um, I do believe that we have a lot to learn. So, from Switzerland yes, or from, from each other? Switzerland. And I think we can... Uh, what sort of things could you learn? Well, for example, you have a system, uh, an electoral system that's working. You have the referendums where people participate more. We don't have that in Europe, actually. So you educate your citizens in many different things so that they can make decisions. A very warm welcome. You're watching The Big Picture. I'm Martina Fox. Let's kick off the show. stories making news here in Switzerland and around the world. Setting the stage for a very interesting time in Swiss politics, the current economic minister Johann schneider amann has announced he'll stand down. In an interview with the NZZ, the 66-year-old said he would not be standing for re-election at the end of 2019. It's an opportunity for the Federal Council to shake things up in the future. Doris Leuthard, the former president, had also previously announced she'll be stepping down at the end of the term. Thomas Jordan, the chairman of the Swiss National Bank, has given his thoughts this Friday on the sovereign money referendum, saying it would bring great uncertainty. The initiative aims to prevent commercial banks from creating money electronically, meaning the SNB would be the only ones who could do so. 
Swiss people will vote on the issue on June the 10th. Speaking today, Jordan also said that the Swiss franc is still highly valued, but a weaker franc is a welcome relief for the economy. Swiss bank Raiffeisen is seeing a massive shakeup at its highest level. Six out of 11 directors are quitting. The bank hasn't revealed any details surrounding the departures, but Raiffeisen is in the midst of a scandal relating back to the bank's former CEO, Pierin Vincenz. Vincenz is currently in jail, while authorities investigate what they suspect is a series of bad faith deals. Giving peace a chance, Kim Jong-un became the first North Korean leader to cross the border to the south today in a watershed breakthrough in the nuclear-armed peninsula. They agreed to declare an end to the war this year and to aim for complete denuclearization. Meanwhile, Bern issued a statement recognizing the historic nature of the summit. The Federal Council added that Switzerland is, quote, convinced nuclear and security issues on the peninsula can only be resolved via an inclusive diplomatic process. We will have much more on this historic meeting later tonight on The Big Picture. Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump hosts another world leader today. After French President Emmanuel Macron's visit to Washington this week failed to convince Mr. Trump to change his mind on the Iran deal, German leader Angela Merkel gets her chance and maybe also steer him away from trade war with Europe. There won't be a red carpet rollout for Merkel, however. Just a 20-minute all-office meeting, lunch and a half-hour news conference is on the menu. But her mission is the same, to get Mr. Trump to re-engage with Europe and the world. Coming up after the break, we'll have a short wrap-up of the entertainment stories as well as your weather forecast up next for your weekend weather. Stay tuned on CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. Summer is on its way, so let's start getting in the mood with our weekly look at what's hot in the world of entertainment, culture, and the arts. And as always, we're keeping an eye on those money angles. Coming up, the God of Thunder is back and is set to do storming business at the box office. There is drama of a different kind brewing at the Zurich Opera House. Jermaine Jackson is helping Swiss children find their voice. And J-Lo is showing no signs of slowing down anytime soon. I am Ana Maria Montero, and let's get started. Has it really been a decade since these guys found a new lease on life lighting up the big screen? The answer is yes. It's been 10 years since the Marvel Universe started breaking box office records with its take on the world of superheroes versus villains. And of course, stars like Chris Hemsworth, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Robert Downey Jr. have all helped to draw huge audiences. The interconnected movies have earned $15 billion in the process. 
This week, the franchise reached a crescendo, which is arguably the biggest cinematic event of the year, if not all time. Infinity War is out in Switzerland, and Rick Damagella talks with members of the Avengers cast about the upcoming battle. There was an idea to bring together a group of remarkable people to see if we could become something more. 10 years, 18 consecutive number one movies, and $15 billion in global box office have led up to this. Avengers Assemble for Infinity War. That means assembling heroes from all across the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Everybody got to stay who they were. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like it just became a hodgepodge of all the Avengers. That, the Guardians are still the Guardians, you know. Uh, the Avengers are still the Avengers, Spider-Man still Spider-Man. Everyone still kept their identity, but found a way to merge them all together. And it's a testament to the writers. I think it may have helped too that we were all, we were already familiar with each other's characters and we were familiar mm -hmm. with those worlds. And right. didn't never seem like it was a, a chore, you know, interacting with each other. It just seemed like a natural thing. Who the hell are you guys? Pretty intense, I gotta say. I was walking into the Guardian ship with the Guardian, so it was like walking onto a Guardians movie, not an Avengers movie. And I, I gotta say, I had some nervous energy, some, some, uh, you know, the butterflies. <laughs> we don't really have to do much. You could take any two characters from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, put them on a stage together, and there's already gonna be a world of tension and or comedy or irony or drama that the audience is gonna have because the stories are baked into these characters. Yeah. But this <laughs> does put a smile on my face. Josh Brolin plays Thanos, the big bad the MCU has been building towards. Well, I had a much better time than I thought I was gonna have. I came in with very low expectations, having done some teasers, and we were surrounded by, you know, really bright lights and 36 cameras, and I was, I was sitting the whole time. I could hear a director's voice out there, so I kind of thought that's how it was gonna be, and it was kind of a bummer, and then I got on set. And then it was a totally different thing. How does the mastermind behind the scenes of the MCU feel as the movie's release nears? It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming, but I can't wait for the people to see the movie. I can't wait for people to see what happens when the Guardians and the Avengers and Thor and Doctor Strange and Spider-Man all come together for the first time. I hope they remember you. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. Time now for a look at my A-list entertainment stories of the week. Feathers at the ready. Jennifer Lopez was in full flight in New York this week. The actress and singer performed at the Time 100 Gala. The American news publication organizes the event to highlight its annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. J-Lo was one of this year's recipients of the accolade. Roger Federer was also amongst those who appeared on the Roll of Honor. The tennis champion was recognized in the Titans category, which earned him one of the cover spots. And now from one seasoned singing performer to another. Jermaine Jackson is in Switzerland. That's right. The American artist is helping potential stars of the future get their first big break. The singer is one of the judges of the Kids' Voice Tour 2018. The TV show is in its fourth season, and the final is shown on Saturday. It's been filmed in major cities across the country, with auditions taking place over the past six months. La, 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 la. 2,000 young hopefuls have had a taste of what it's like to take the mic and perform. The spotlight is now on the eight finalists who come from cities such as Bern, Zurich, and Lausanne. And this talented bunch will add an international flavor to their performances. This is because they will be singing in a range of languages, including French, English, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese. Now, someone who knows what all this is like to step into the spotlight is last year's winner, Victoria. And if winning wasn't exciting enough, she will be recording a song written by the show's producer, Paul Sutton. That will be happening in London's famous Abbey Road Studios. So back to this year's big event, and the finalists will get the chance to sing with Jermaine Jackson, which I'm sure will be a moment to remember. Kids' voice, is, 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 it's a great idea. My um, longtime friend, Paul Sutton, who's the 
boss uh, and the producer. He, he told me about this a while back, but it's great to see it come alive now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's great when you give the kids an opportunity to show their talent and to mentor them. Is this the real Melania Trump? Or is this the real Melania? Or even the real president, for that matter? That's coming up later. But first, Switzerland's largest city is limbering up for a new ballet. The Zurich Opera is staging a new production which sees the main character making a pact with the devil. The final rehearsals are underway, and Tanya Koenig's been along for a behind-the-scenes look. The Legend of Faust by Goethe is one of the most celebrated stories in the history of literature. And beginning on Saturday, uh, the Zurich Opera House will be staging a ballet version of the story. And I'm here at the Opera House to meet up with the renowned choreographer Edward Klug. Why did you choose to use ballet to tell the story of Faust? You know, it seems probably impossible and that's uh, the tempting thing. I, I want to literally deliver the narrative that suits the 21st century mind. Uh, I'm not interested in doing a, the narrative which was done excellent in um, last century. What I do has to go beyond dance and has to go beyond the story has to go beyond the theater and all the elements involved. But nevertheless, it's the most important to give everything one single meaning. Uh, I know very good dancers, which was uh, easier to get into such a complex topics, you know, to, to uh, demand from the dancers, you know, go beyond their, uh, their uh, knowledge and together discover a way on telling things without words. Where will the viewers see your signature movements throughout the dance? I'm not interested about my signature. I'm interested that they see Goethe's signature uh, and uh, really feel the impact. Uh, I want them to participate in the story, um, relay on their own experience to the story and to the uh, things they are going to discover, connect. And uh, I definitely want them to come with an uh, individual conclusion. How experimental can you be by telling a classical story, you know, a, a story that is so known? That was very tricky. I like to play with um, unusual, uh, absurd, and uh, I deliberately make very important things appear less important and uh, that uh, enable a natural flow between what I want to do and um, what you're going to get. Do you deal with the finance and how difficult is it to put up a, a play like that? Zurich Opera House, it's an amazing uh, institution that gets great support from the sponsors and from the, from the city, from the government, I suppose. So uh, in that sense, you know, uh, I never thought about money during the, during the process, but I, I, I've been working, I, I'm, I'm coming from those countries where it's, uh, it's an everyday issue and we struggle with that. And, uh, but that push it to, you know, uh, be more, Innovated. Innovative. <laughs> you know, so which of course is not a formula, but uh, um, here I felt even more responsible because I get such a wonderful uh, support from all departments involved and uh, of course, nevertheless, from the, from the dancers, which are truly fabulous. Edward Klug, thank you very much and good luck with your premiere. Thank you so much. The relatively soft-spoken First Lady may not be known to wax poetic on a lot of issues, but a version of Melania Trump made of actual wax is saying all sorts of things people are tweeting on her behalf. It's gone on display at Madame Tussaud in New York. Jeannie Most reports. Question one, which is the real Melania? Time's up. Question two, which one of these three is flesh and blood? <laughs> Former White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer helped unveil Madame Tussauds' latest wax figure. You can touch her hair. You know, we encourage people to take selfies. Is it okay if I hold her hand? Sure. Unlike the real one. Thus, I got to do what the president sometimes can't. Trump tried to hold Melania's hand. <laughs> and nope. Actually, she was holding his hand minutes earlier, just not while they posed for an official photo. We wonder, does she ever seem mad at the president? Not that I ever saw. As a spouse of 14 years, I, I've had my own awkward moments, but I, I think there's a genuine 
uh, love and concern. Spicer was genuinely concerned with promoting his new book. Wax Melania is dressed in a replica of a blue dress she wore to a debate. Madame Tussauds invites the public to give Melania a voice. You can compose a tweet on behalf of the Wax First Lady. Oh, never mind, it's just a publicity stunt. Melania will be moved from New York to Washington at the end of May. Until then, her neighbors include the Obamas, the Pope, and the Queen, along with Prince William and Kate. I'm just going to hold her hand while yeah. we talk. It's <laughs> good. It makes more comfortable. At least Wax Melania doesn't mind the jokes. He's like trying to arouse a dead trout. There's something fishy about these fingers, too. Chinimo, CNN, New York. And on that note, it's time to wrap up the red carpet. So until next time, I'm Ana Maria Montero. Have a great weekend. North and South Korea embark on a new era. Coming up, we take a look at this historic day. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's a historic day for Korea and the world. Just months ago, it seemed almost inevitable that hostilities would return to the Korean peninsula. This morning, the world faces a startling new prospect, a peninsula at peace. Leaders of North Korea and South Korea have promised an end to the Korean War later this year, one of the world's longest running conflicts. North Korea's Kim Jong-un and South Korea's Moon Jae-in say they intend to formally end the Korean War later this year, 65 years after fighting stopped. The leaders of North and South Korea met at the DMC this morning for the much-anticipated historic summit. They did not disappoint. Moon and Kim announced a goal of achieving a nuclear-free Korean peninsula through complete denuclearization. Chairman Kim and I myself would like to declare Panmunjom Declaration. We had a historical meeting and reached a very precious and valuable agreement. There will not be any more war on the Korean Peninsula. The new era of peace has finally opened, and we are declaring that. They also said the two nations will work to reunify divided families. As I stand here today, I can see that uh, uh, South and North Korea are the same people of the same blood. They cannot be separated together. We are the compatriots, and uh, it has really uh, uh, brought strong emotions to myself as well. And uh, we are not uh, a people that, uh, that should be confronting each other, that we are of the same people that should uh, live in unity. I hope that uh, we will be able to live very peacefully in the future. There were plenty of made-for-TV moments during the summit. The spectacle of Kim walking over to the border, becoming the first North Korean leader to ever visit the South, and being greeted with a warm handshake by Moon. And then, unexpectedly, the two leaders grabbed hands and briefly crossed the border again into the North in another symbolic gesture. Later at the DMC's Peace House, Kim wrote in the guest book, a new history begins now. But lots of questions are still unanswered. Do the North and the South mean the same thing by denuclearization? Are the North Koreans serious this time? They've used the charm offense before, making big promises to shave off sanctions, then pulling back. CNN's Paula Hancock has a wrap-up of the historic day. Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and a vow to end the Korean War. Together on the south side of the divide, President and Supreme Leader deliver the aspirational decree. Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in announced what would have been unimaginable just 12 months ago when the North threatened to turn Seoul into a sea of fire. Today, Chairman Kim and I have agreed that a complete denuclearization will be achieved, and that is our common goal. This historic moment after a day made for television and the history books. Kim Jong-un grips President Moon's hand and steps over the simple concrete line that represents a Korea divided for generations. 
and militarised to the brink of destruction. Hand in hand, they take a symbolic and unscripted step into the north. <laughs> Kim is now the first in a dynasty of dictators to travel to the south since the armistice in 1953. I came here with a mindset that I'm standing at the starting line of a new history of the North-South relationship. A unified Korea remains a long way off. For now, it's about guaranteeing survival. The North needs relief from biting sanctions. For the South and the watching world, it's the promise of denuclearization. But an afternoon walk in a DMZ garden offers the leaders a chance for private discussion. Stern faces betray an intense conversation. Pageantry returns as the men meet their wives for a banquet. The menu, sourced from across the Korean peninsula, offers a reminder of what unites the two. Millions across both Koreas and around the world wait for what will happen when Donald Trump comes to the table. Paula Hancock's CNN, near the DMZ. The question also remains, what does this mean for U.S. President Donald Trump? This sets the stage for the first meeting between a sitting U.S. president and North Korean leader when Donald Trump and Kim meet in late May or June. The news is breaking almost non-stop on this historic story. Sports news now, and there's been bucket loads of drama so far in this year's Formula One season. And this weekend promises yet more. Narrow corners and a long straight will keep drivers on their toes when they return to Baku City circuit in Azerbaijan. Before practice got underway, CNN's Amanda Davis asked the drivers how their dream circuit would look like. If you could put a circuit anywhere in the world, where would you put it? In my hometown, you know, in the north of Spain, beautiful. I think I would put it in Denmark um, to have a home race. New Zealand. Okay. Um, very far away. I would put it between a part in Switzerland and a part in France. You know, as I'm, I'm out of three South French. So. Yeah, that's a good question. I would probably put it in Miami. So what would it look like? Just. Let's try. It's actually very hard. I'd start with, with the main straight, which obviously isn't going to be straight because we don't like straights. Yeah, let, let's get a straight line, that's fairly easy. And a big hairpin, so you've got some good overtaking maneuver. Half oval. Yes. We recognize that. An Indianapolis uh, and you know inspiration. I'll probably go for a mix of some of the nice corners on the Formula 1 calendar. This could be the most dizzy circuit that you're ever going to find. A massive elevation where at the bottom it's, it's fully dry and then as you go up okay. you, you know, get to snow. Just doing something completely crazy here. So we can take a rouge. A rouge. And uh, would you have the, the big uh, hill as well? Yes. You'd make, yeah. Yes, definitely. We're going back down to the lake. Okay. Uh, let's so put the, the lake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some fish. Down this whole strip, there needs to just be. This would be the, the garages on this side, with a view over to the beach. Tight hairpin, more or less like Austin, also in ten one. Probably here, I imagine going uphill and, uh, you know, start the corner and then it closes up. We probably need another heaven just to have a bit of space. <laughs> Come out of here and then you go into a banked curve, then into a chicane. And very long circuit. I love long circuits, long laps. So lap that takes four or five minutes, so maybe, I don't know, 15 Ks. Okay. Circuit. So where is the best vantage point for watching, do you think? Yeah, with 15 Ks, you can yeah. put uh, millions of people, you know, in the ground and stand around. You'd see quite a lot here. Maybe on a... here. The top of the mountain. I like it. And do we have a, a Kevin Magnuson stand or a Kevin Magnuson corner? Or they would just be everywhere around the track. <laughs> the whole track. <laughs> uh, so, do, do you think it's got a realistic chance of making it onto the calendar? No, absolutely not. I have no hope because I don't think it would be technically possible. Project for which? Yeah. What year will we see it? Twenty. 23. Awesome. Five years time. The, the long roller coaster, I think this could be, you know, the, it goes, it goes up. Up. My mum is an artist. If she sees this, she's going to kill me. <laughs> 
very creative drivers there. Meanwhile, if you fancy a taste of the Formula One life and you have a spare 285,000 US dollars, you can buy McLaren's Street Legal 720S from May. McLaren's most opulent car to date debuted at the Geneva Motor Show in March. Back then, my colleague Hannah Weiss caught a sneak peek. Let's take a look. McLaren, beautifully designed, fast, and surprisingly refined. Racing fans will know McLaren as a dominating force on the circuit. And what do you get when a 182-time Formula One winner makes road cars? You get something very special. You know, with a car like this, what you really want is big, wide open spaces. Around here, this is about as good as it gets. Somehow they managed to get 710 horsepower out of a four liter V8. I mean, there's turbochargers, but still, that's a lot. It makes for a very light car. The end result is something like this. Really quick. And it stops really fast. If you don't have a track or can't find a 14,000 space parking lot like this one, McLaren cars are still a blast on ordinary roads. Crushing acceleration, scalpel sharp steering, but still friendly. This one's all race tracked out. I've got sports racing seats that don't adjust hardly at all. I've got big carbon fiber ceramic brakes. Considering what this thing's capable of, the 720S is actually a fairly well-mannered car. Which is what you would expect from a British supercar. Cool looking and fast, but really nothing improper. Mamma Mia. ABBA is getting the band back together. The Swedish pop group announced today on its official Instagram account that an earlier announced Avatar tour of the band dubbed Avatars helped rekindle the magic. The group disbanded in 1982. In, 19, in 2016, rather, I should say, though there was a reunion of sorts in Stockholm for the opening of a restaurant by one of the original band members, Bjorn Ulvaeus. The eatery was based on the Greek tavern featured in Mamma Mia, the Broadway musical he helped create. Based around ABBA's songs, he gave CNN a guided tour a few years ago. It took years. It, it took two and a half to three years, I think, uh, from when the idea was first born till the opening. <laughs> this venue, there's a big party going on every night. Mamma Mia! A party inspired by the runaway success of Mamma Mia! the musical, which in turn was inspired by ABBA, one of the most successful bands of all time. At the end of each performance, people stand up and sing and, and, and dance in the aisles, and there's like a party mood. And I always had the feeling that if people uh, could have gone on to some other place and have a party, they would. And that's exactly the idea behind Mamma Mia! The Party, a Greek-style restaurant launched just this January and able to host about 450 people each night, lured in by the unique mix of food and performances. We thought it would be nice to have a little story played out in real time every every evening while people are eating and drinking and having fun through dialogue and through ABBA songs. Something that appears to be keeping the Swedish pop group in the limelight even decades after their split. The band recently reunited on stage for the launch of Mamma Mia! The Party, their first joint appearance in years. It took a split second and then it felt so familiar, you know, standing there with those other three people with whom I've been standing on so many stages around the world. 
like this winning performance of Waterloo at the Eurovision Song Contest in 1974. Stockholm set to host the annual singing competition in May, and Björn plans to launch Mamma Mia! The Party in English around the same time, taking him one step closer to his next dream. It's like this show was made for, for New York, I think. And Mamma Mia! ran there on Broadway for 14 years. I want to go back, and, and to have a show there is amazing. How do the leaders of tomorrow feel about their future careers? Is the future met with optimism or skepticism? What kind of careers do they see for themselves? Find out in our special panel discussion just after this break. The upcoming 48th St. Gallen Symposium, which will take place next week from May the 2nd to the 4th, is taking a deep dive into the theme of Beyond the End of Work. The St. Gallen Symposium just released their Global Perspectives Barometer 2018 today. And earlier I discussed the findings with a very special panel. May the 2nd to the 4th, focusing on the theme beyond the end of work. The St. Gallen Symposium just released the Global Perspectives Barometer 2018 today, and the study was conducted this February in English in cooperation with the GFK Verein, with a total of 1,400 leaders of tomorrow participating in the online survey. Well, leaders of tomorrow are promising global young talent selected by the symposium each year. 200 academics, politicians, entrepreneurs and professionals of around 30 years or younger are invited. So what are the key findings? Well, the key outcomes are that the leaders of tomorrow have a very optimistic view when it comes to the future of work. 53% are even excited about their future careers, seeing a world of possibility. But interestingly, the next generation of leaders primarily looks for intrinsic motivation at work. Many of the participants expect their work life to be interesting. They want to change to and contribute to society or to learn new things. They think that work should offer a good salary, a lot of autonomy and a chance to work with interesting people around them. But traditional motivation factors seem to have lost meaning for the surveyed top talent. Employee benefits and job security land on the last rank. And another interesting finding we have to discuss tonight, leaders of tomorrow prefer being an expert or an entrepreneur over being a top level executive. And uh, joining me now to discuss all these issues is uh, Ms. Uh, Simona Scarpaleccia. She is uh, the CEO and country manager at IKEA sitting next to me. Then we have uh, Mr. Rafael Schad. He is a entrepreneur and innovation coach. And here on my right is Mr. Kaspar Kachli. He is from the University of St. Gallen, a project manager who has worked on this study. Now, Ms. Skarpaleccia, let me start with you. Are you surprised by the findings of this study? Well, being a mother of three, who are more or less of the age of those who replied, not really, uh, for some reasons. Uh, uh, the optimism is fundamental, it's really good news, and the curiosity for the new technologies is there. And I see it at home, but I see it also at IKEA with our co-workers, the young generations. Rafael, you are of this young generation that uh, Ms. Carpaleccia mentions. Do you agree with what she's saying? And uh, what has been some of the surprise, you know, effect from that study for you? Sure, yeah, I, I do share the uh, optimism. Um, and one of the things that was uh, kind of surprising that you touched on uh, previously was um, that a lot of the young people, they want to become an entrepreneur or kind of... Like forge you are. For, yeah, that's right, yeah. So um, you're living your dream, basically. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to kind of do what I uh, want to do, but it's also a very uncertain path. It's also a path with a lot of hard work. Um, and I think the main kind of thing that we can take away from that is perhaps that the current young generation is a little bit less... Um, focus on climbing existing structures and rather kind of build their own structures, even though they might be a little bit smaller. 
Kaspar, uh, you have worked with a lot of leaders of tomorrow at the uh, St. Gallen Symposium, where Raphael and I were actually also leaders of uh, tomorrow sure. in 2017. There seems to be an incredible amount of optimism, almost a little bit, hmm, shall I say, naive, maybe? What do you think? What do you feel when you talk to these uh, survey participants? Why are they so bullish on their work future? Right. Uh, while looking at our sample, we consider a lot of ambitious students and young entrepreneurs, and there's a strong belief in technology. And that is due to the immense progress we've seen in the last 20 to 30 re re uh, years. Um, but we can also see the challenges we face. So 69% of our respondents said there's inequality on the rise. So they see that inequality in terms of wages, but also opportunities. So we really need to make sure as a society that we have equal opportunities. Um, for everyone. And the third point I would like to make is really the unique sample we have of ambitious students, young, young entrepreneurs, young politicians, and they are really working with this technology. So this result isn't a real surprise because they're working with it and benefit directly. It seems from it. that they really want to be, you know, excited about the job. And what is surprising to me is that actually the salary level is not important anymore, like cash doesn't count, but really that much anymore, but really to have a purpose and a meaning in your job. Is this what you're sensing when you talk to these young talents? I think so, yeah. I think every human being has this sense of drive in itself to really make a positive impact on the, on the world. Uh, and therefore, that's like a logical result. We can, we can see that. And also the importance of work is growing in terms of our identity but also um, in our role as a society. So that's what Ms. Carpaleccia, you are a top-level executive here in Switzerland, on top of that, a woman. Now, it looks like a lot of the young people here do not want to become CEOs anymore. Is it you know, difficult for you to find staff and the recruitment process to join a big company like IKEA? What I see is that the search for a purpose is absolutely uh, very, very positive. And for instance, we work in a very traditional sector, retail, uh, but what we want to propose is uh, we are not simply selling furniture, we are improving people's lives. And it changes completely the perspective. And you can be a super technological expert, you can be uh, the person who consults the customers in, um, in the furnishing the home, but you improve their lives, and this is the purpose. So if we play that, we can really have uh, nice people. It must be a challenge, though, for big multinationals uh, like IKEA to give a purpose to the employee to make sure that still there is enough career development, promotion, so that they can have this sense of purpose and meaning, otherwise they might get frustrated, the young people, very well, I soon. Think it, I found very interesting what you said. Um, uh, the, the world of work is changing a lot and this pyramid model is not valid anymore. So I, I think we should forget about having this escalation to the CEO, but working and making an impact. We are working more and more in groups, in task force, uh, uh, and, and what you realize is what gives satisfaction. We have seen uh, in the survey uh, that you mentioned, uh, Raphael, that about 98% of the participants, they would use the help of AI for organizing workflows and processes. So really automation AI is key. You're also an innovation coach. How do you embed that? And what do you tell the young people, you know, who are eager to study and learn more about AI and automation and want to implement that in their work too? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, um, AI right now is a very hot topic. And what I basically do is I, I kind of studied um, how can humans and machines work together optimally. So I don't think it's about replacing humans by uh, robots, uh, kind of, you know, the, replacing the muscle, or algorithms re replacing kind of our intellectual skills. Um, I really think that it's kind of a, a, a concert, working concert, humans and machines together. Um, but I also understand kind of fear from some of the people, as we heard uh, at the beginning of this conversation from Kaspar, this is not necessarily a representative study. Um, I think most people that were surveyed, they actually um, will benefit from kind of amplifying their, their workflow. And I understand if uh, some people actually fear change and they are, are, are kind of fearing, depending on how, how and where they work, um, that they might be replaced. And so um, what I'm really concerned about is kind of designing the interface between the humans and how we actually use these new technologies and kind of leverage the machines as opposed to sort of the other way around.
at your company, Ms. Karpalecha, how do you train staff, you know, as a huge retail and manufacturing company to not be scared of yeah. the new technologies and the robots yeah. that are coming? I believe we as a company, we do have a responsibility to look ahead and see what uh, can happen and support all of us because this will touch all of us. We need to unlearn relearn and uh, upskill ourselves continuously, most probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, by uh, removing the fears uh, about this renewal and, and bringing the positive impact of the renewal, we can really move the company and the people in a better place. Kaspar, you have been a student at the University of St. Gallen and are now the project manager for this uh, Global uh, Perspectives uh, Barometer 2018. What are some of the fears that you still have? Because you didn't graduate that long ago and you might still be, you know, uh, concerned by some of the things that Ms. Skarbalecha is saying, the new wave of robots and AI and drones and blockchain and cryptocurrencies. What are, what are some of the worries for you? Right, so I'm actually still in kind of the university phase, so I'm not graduated yet. Um, but I think the fears are really the, the kind of social contract which needs to hold, really to have to give everybody the same opportunity we can and to really make sure that everybody finds a job he's really, uh, he can work into, into a field he's passionate about, which is important and, and the outcomes will be, will be so there if you can do that. So once you graduate, once you do, what do you want to do afterwards? That's a, that's a fascinating Are question. Are you more the traditional kind, you know, who looks for financial stability, job security, or are you more the freedom seeker that we have seen in this study who wants to be independent and maybe start a startup company? Right. To be honest, I, I think it has to be something like of both things, <laughs> uh, which is hard to find, but really have the freedom to work on a, on a topic you're passionate about, to be like a, like a thought leader in that, but also to have some kind of stability because our study showed that um, to have, to make a living is still an important thing um, people look for, obviously, in doing a job. You Maybe. have gone exactly yeah, to, speak, to that, <laughs> speak, Rafi. Speak to that. Um, it's, uh, it's fascinating what, what Karsh was mentioning here. Kind of, you kind of want to have the best of both worlds. Give us teams. a little bit of background um, because you went the other way, really not going for security and stability, but you actually went to Silicon Valley, had your projects there, studied at the MIT. You're more of the new generation startup entrepreneur, isn't it? Perhaps, yeah. Um, and and it's, I recently returned back to Switzerland. I, I love it here. Um, uh, but I did venture out and uh, learn, learned a lot. I worked um, for four and a half years in Silicon Valley and did the whole startup thing there. Um, and, and I studied at MIT. Um, but uh, I think now back, I also kind of need to find this balance that Cosper is talking about. And on one hand, I'm back here to start a startup, start a company, and kind of be the CEO of you know, something uh, maybe smaller than, than IKEA or an existing company. So what has um, been your intrinsic motivation? Is it to start something new, to be a pioneer, or just you didn't fit into any of these big company formats and frameworks? Well, it, it almost seems that I actually still kind of do and also have to. So um, uh, on, on the other hand, I do uh, consult for big and existing companies, right? They do have working businesses and products, so I respect that highly. So I'm kind of trying to uh, do both in both worlds. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, an, it's an interesting, uh, interesting challenge. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm respecting existing companies a lot. And I think it was also really fascinating what you said at the very beginning, um, how IKEA is kind of looking into a distributed model. And, um, and you can also find ownership. Uh, not just by starting a company, but maybe by you know, running, kind of uh, owning the, the, the sort of trajectory of a, a team or a product and being given responsibility within a bigger company. There are so many new business models, right? But also the environment, regulatory, political, social, financial, has to be right. Do you think, uh, Ms. Karpalecha, that Switzerland offers enough in terms of future of work and for young people to find what they're looking for? Well, what I can see is that Switzerland is very interested in this topic. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very innovative country. It's uh, up on Maybe all the rankings. Maybe less than Sweden and other yes, Scandinavian yes, nations. It's, it's up in the rankings and uh, there is a collective effort to understand the phenomena and, and facilitate that. And I value that very positively. How important is, for example, a platform, Kaspar, like the St. Gallen Symposium, you know, to offer young people new perspectives, uh, new insights, and also the networking to the big shots of different industries? 
I think that's a unique opportunity, the St. Gallen Symposium. It brings together this year three generation of people to really uh, bring their perspective on a, on a big stage. As you mentioned, with talking to Mrs. Scarpa Lecture, it's a unique opportunity for a student. And we had, we had some amazing stories happening at the symposium, with, which had impacted many, many people. And I think uh, we'll, we'll still do. As you mentioned, there will be three generations of business right. leaders. What are some of the things that you think, as a young student, you can still learn from the older generation? Is it the discipline or the focus or you know, financial security? What can you I learn think, from them? I think it's two things. One is taking responsibility and being ready at the moment when you need to be ready. I think that- Be at the right time, right. at the right place. This right. is what my grandfather also always <laughs> says. So this is two generations away, but this is definitely something I could learn. I would still really emphasize that, yeah. Good. So um, for Rafi, what are your plans now? I mean, talking about the future of work and career plans, um, do you want to settle at some point and, and have more employees in your startup uh, environment? Or do you want to stay you know, as free as possible? A free sure. man? Yeah, no, no. I'm really interested in, uh, in, in building something that can have a, an impact on, on society. And so the best work I've always done was in teams. Um, so eventually, I don't want to just be a, a one person uh, show, but really, um, work with with uh, motivated and, and brilliant people, um, and so uh, hopefully you know uh, I get there. And, and un until then, I already work with you know very brilliant people on, from from bigger companies, and I'm excited to go and debate at this year's uh, symposium with the current leaders um, uh, of today about you know kind of how the future of work might shape up, shape up and and where sort of the, the respective roles are. Ms. Karpalecha, now you also go into the uh, St. Gallen Symposium. What is your advice to these young people in terms of work ethics and also in terms of their you know, future dreams, what they want to uh, become and how they can fulfill those? Well, if I can say two things. The first one, creativity is so important. So don't give it up. Don't be framed. I mean, we, we, it's so easy to be framed. So it built on that. And the other thing also, praise imperfection. These machines are fantastic. They can work fantastically well. You can partner, let's say, with machines. But imperfection is so human and so warm. It's so beautiful. So don't freak out if you make some mistakes. It's so Nothing nice. Nothing is perfect, that's for Very sure. Nice. So last word to my man from the uh, St. Gallen Symposium, <laughs> Kaspar. What are your expectations in a couple of words uh, for the uh, 48th St. Gallen Symposium starting next Wednesday to Friday? Right. I, I really hope for healthy discussion, really openly debate about the issues we face as a society, as a world, as business leaders um, like Mrs. Scarpaleccia, and really have this debate um, be open about everything and kind of bring that little, little change to the world that might be needed. And hopefully most of us can have a job that makes them feel happy. Thank you so much to my exciting again, panel of guests, uh, Ms. Karpalecha from IKEA, Mr. Uh, Schad, who is an entrepreneur and innovator, and Kaspar Köchli from the uh, St. Gallen Symposium. And that's it for the big picture. Up next is a newsmaker with my colleague Hannah Wise. I'll be seeing you from the 48th St. Gallen Symposium, reporting from the ground with a lot of interviews and interesting stories. Stay tuned and I wish you a great weekend. See you very soon. Good night. New recommendations for Switzerland boosting its blockchain industry. Eva Kiley is a member of the European Parliament and she says that Switzerland has an important role to play in the evolution of technology and data protection. It's one of the countries we are working very closely and um, I do believe that we have a lot to learn. So, from Switzerland yes, or from, from each other? Switzerland. And I think we can... Uh, what sort of things could you learn? Well, for example, you have a system, uh, an electoral system that's working. You have the referendums where people participate more. We don't have that in Europe, actually. So you educate your citizens in many different things so that they can make decisions. And tech stocks are putting smiles on faces, but for how long? All the analysis on this week's financial ups and downs coming up on this programme. Good evening and welcome. I'm Hannah Wise. 
And this is the Newsmaker Hour here on the Swiss Pulse. Newsmaker Hour on Friday the 27th of April will start tonight with a roundup of the main news headlines. Setting the stage for a very interesting time in Swiss politics, the current economic minister Johann Schneider Amann has announced he'll stand down. In an interview with the NZZ, the 66-year-old said he would not be standing for re-election at the end of 2019. It's an opportunity for the Federal Council to shake things up in the future. Doris Lighthart, the former president, had also previously announced she'll be stepping down at the end of the term. Thomas Jordan, the chairman of the Swiss National Bank, has given his thoughts this Friday on the sovereign money referendum, saying it would bring great uncertainty. The initiative aims to prevent commercial banks from creating money electronically, meaning the SNB would be the only ones who could do so. Swiss people will vote on the issue on June the 10th. Speaking today, Jordan also said that the Swiss franc is still highly valued, but a weaker franc is welcome relief for the economy. Swiss bank Raiffeisen is seeing a massive shake-up at its highest level. Six out of 11 directors are quitting. The bank hasn't revealed any details surrounding the departures, but Raiffeisen is in the midst of a scandal relating back to the bank's former CEO, Pierre and Vincenz. Now, Vincenz is currently in jail, while authorities investigate what they suspect is a series of bad faith deals. Giving peace a chance, Kim Jong-un became the first North Korean leader to cross the border to South Korea today. He agreed to declare an end to the war this year and to aim for complete denuclearization. Meanwhile, Bern issued a statement recognising the historic nature of the summit. The Federal Council added that Switzerland is convinced nuclear and security issues on the peninsula can only be resolved via an inclusive diplomatic process. Well, meanwhile, US President Trump hosts another world leader today after French President Emmanuel Macron's visit to Washington this week failed to convince Mr Trump to change his mind on the Iran deal. German leader Angela Merkel gets her chance and maybe also steer him away from trade war with Europe. There won't be a red carpet rollout for Merkel, however. Just a 20-minute Oval Office meeting, lunch and then a half-hour news conference. Her mission, though, is the same, to get Mr Trump to re-engage with Europe and the rest of the world. All right, stay with us. Uh, after the break, we're going to be breaking down a blockchain's future in Switzerland and finding out how best to ensure user security without stifling technical evolution. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the radar animation of the last 90 minutes. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland. And south of the Alps. Thanks for following us.
Welcome back to the Newsmaker Hour. The Blockchain Task Force has released its recommendations on regulating and promoting the industry in the city of Zug. Federal Councillor Johan Schneider Amman received the recommendations presented in a white paper drawn up by around 50 industry leaders at the Blockchain Summit on Thursday. Well, my colleague Amanda Kane met today's newsmaker Eva Kiley in Zug. She's a member of the European Parliament and she tells us how she's going about creating legal certainty without killing off the dynamics of innovation. Now, Eva, some people say that blockchain is going to be the next internet. It's going to change the world. Do you believe the same? Well, I believe it has the potential, but it, take, it will take some time to develop this technology and to figure out what has to be improved and the potential, because I don't think even the developers themselves, they know how far it can get. But the truth is, I think it's an exciting technology. And how far along do you think we are in terms of realizing the full potential of blockchain? Well, actually, we're already exploring applications and we do believe it can uh, dramatically change the way, for example, even we vote and this would remove uh, the cost. So I'm starting from our side and the e-governance, we could have a lot of things on blockchain um, to reduce bureaucracy also in the, in the parliament, for example, in the governments. At the same time, I do think that uh, we can improve the financial sector. Uh, which means the cost that we have, the hidden fees of transactions, which is over 120 billion per year, hidden fees. Uh, it, can, it has a lot of room to improve with fintech technologies and, of course, blockchain technology. OK, let's start with the, the government, um, because you say we could be able to use blockchain to vote. How far away are we from being able to do that? Actually, there are already applications developed on blockchain that you can vote and uh, you can have anonymous voting, of course, it's not uh, with your name, but you can see live the way that people vote, the participation, how it moves. You can also have some identification if it's men, women, and in which region. Um, I think this is an excellent tool that they've seen work. It's working already. And not just one, I have seen like two to three different applications. So it depends how you want to use it. Why do we need it? Why do we need blockchain to vote? What's not working? How we vote now? Well, you know, when blockchain was um, actually invented, it was a response to not trusting the traditional institutions. So I would say, if you uh, suggest a way of a technology that cannot be altered, the history cannot be deleted, and uh, it can, it, it's immutable, I think uh, people feel that they can trust it. And if you educate them also to use it properly and to protect their privacy, it, has, it can give them uh, amazing potential to, to feel tr that it, there is trust and to use it more and more. For example, there are countries, maybe not in Europe, but even in Europe, where you're not sure that your vote is being counted, not altered, and that the result was not being touched. So I would say in countries like that, being on blockchain, you can go back and see that your vote has not been altered. And of course, a matter of cost also, because you can vote on your phone, so you can reduce the cost of elections from, um, let's say, if it's, a, if it's a million normally, you can pay 100,000 euros to, to have a voting. Now, open the doors for us to your world in Brussels. You're a member of European Parliament. What's the word there? I mean, what are people saying behind closed doors, uh, other members of Parliament, about blockchain? What needs to happen? Well, I can tell you that at the moment I'm just working on the resolution on blockchain from the Industry and Research Committee and we are very supportive. Um, I have support from my colleagues from different pa Maybe parties Maybe just explain to me what the resolution so is. So the resolution ever? shows the approach that we have, which is supporting this technology. Actually, we, can, we are asking for sandboxes, regulatory sandboxes. This means people can explore the potential without being afraid that they're going to have legal issues and that we are also monitoring to find uh, where we need to interfere with you know, some smart regulation, but not on the technology, but, uh, but the applications. So I would say you can see that Europe is supportive. Behind doors, they would talk about an exciting technology that can be a revolution like the internet, as you mentioned before. So if I understand you correctly, you're not working to regulate the technology at the moment because that's still in early stages, yes. but the applications, what's the difference between the technology and the applications? Well, actually, it's like if I tell you that we're regulating internet, 
or regulating Google, Facebook, and how they should comply with our principles. So we're not touching, we're technology neutral actually, and business neutral. These are two principles that we're following. And this makes it innovation friendly. So you can use the technology, and if the use that you decided to, to apply and develop creates problems or legal issues or tax issues, then we go there and we try to ask you to improve that or that by default you have to follow some rules. But we don't touch the technology. The initial technology is like it's treated as an infrastructure. So an infrastructure is there. The way you use it, it's up to you and up to us to regulate. Do you believe that every country, let's say in Europe, is working in the same way and approaching blockchain in the same way? I would say some countries, they don't even explore blockchain. Uh, but uh, I have good news. Just a week ago, 22 countries signed to work together on blockchain applications and solutions. The first would be health data, how they can be protected actually by blockchain. Uh, so I would say they're starting to understand that blockchain is something really important. But there are countries like Switzerland and countries of course like Gibraltar and Luxembourg, even France, that they are more developed and they understand the technology and they try to, um, to follow all the use cases. But some, they have nothing on that. The technology is complex, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in terms of trying to understand it and ensuring that we're all speaking the same language, are the same terms used universally? Well, uh, we are also trying to have a common definition, so you make a good point. If I could just have a short definition, I would say they are distributed, decentralized databases. So that would be the shortest one. But what that offers is you can have peer-to-peer -peer exchange, transaction of value, without intermediaries, so disintermediation. And I see potential in any field, the energy sector, health sector, uh, financial sector, and governance, of course, as I mentioned. So we're exploring also the way we can define it properly. Because not just the blockchain, but as I said, the currencies, the ICOs, the tokens, because the definition could create tax implications, legal problems, and I, we have really to be careful to make sure that we, um, we're making the right definition. And do you believe it's, say, members of parliament that have this responsibility? Whose responsibility is it essentially to make sure that we are supporting blockchain and various technologies, the ICOs, um, and getting them to a point and helping them to get to a point they need to be at? Well, it's a shared responsibility. So we are working from the European Parliament. We're trying to protect citizens using the technology to uh, give them tools to control their data, to have uh, easier access to, um, to applications and, and maybe services, but also with less fees and less friction. At the same time, the Commission has to see that we have a positive approach and then come with the experts to create the standards that we need to have and of course to approach the industry and the developers to understand how this technology can by default in the protocol initially to be compliant with GDPR for example or um, with other principles that we need to, to apply. So it, it's a shared responsibility and I don't think it's something stable because it's, as I said, it's developing. Is it your impression that enough uh influential people in, in the banking industry or maybe central banks that, do they understand this technology enough? Well, um, some understand it and that's why some like it and some don't, if I can say that. But one thing that this uh, technology did is to create a response to having centralized banking. For example, in Cyprus, one day after the, cri the crisis hit Greece, it hit Cyprus, one day, suddenly, a weekend, people lost their deposits. Some banks sat down and they couldn't control what they had deposited there for their pensions, for their insurance, for their children. And I think this triggered and caused a reaction. That's why we have the first university that gives you a master on blockchain in Cyprus. So I, I would say this is connected. So if the central banks have a better solution to guarantee our deposits, then they can't compete with new, new technologies and then people would not need to use them. But since they cannot, this comes as a solution by the people for the people. 
So um, I can tell you that the first approach I had uh, was uh, to understand the virtual currencies and the uses. And I asked Mario Draghi, uh, our central banker, what he thinks of uh, Bitcoin. So his response was, we're monitoring it. They don't really like it. And they don't treat it as a legal tender. And the same day he sent the letter, the European Court of Justice um, responded to a case that we treat it as legal tender, so there are tax exemptions. So you understand the approach? Yes. That's clear. I'm amazed we spoke for nearly 10 minutes without mentioning Bitcoin. Um, are you an investor of Bitcoin? Where's no. Bitcoin's place? <laughs> um, basically, I'm an explorer of these technologies. So I'm trying to understand the different currencies, but also the, I see that it's more, so much more than... And how are you Bitcoin. educating yourself? How are you learning about this? Because you didn't grow up with this. No. I'm following a lot of events like this one today. I'm traveling around the world to try to understand it. I'm talking to developers and forums and, uh, and also I'm trying myself to learn a bit of uh, coding and to try to open and see how I could start learning about this technology. And of course I'm trying to download e-wallets. So this was difficult. So unless you try to explore the applications yourself, you cannot understand uh, how useful it can be or the problems you might face. And we'll be finding out what role Switzerland can play in all this after the break. Welcome back to the Newsmaker Hour this Friday. It's time now for part two of our interview with Member of the European Parliament, Eva Kiley. She's a firm believer that blockchain has an important role in our future. And here she tells Amanda Kane about the viability of a crypto valley in Switzerland. Well, Switzerland has a tradition in the financial sector of leading it in um, a way that it's more friendly to the market and the industry. So I do believe there is potential to have actually a crypto valley uh, in Europe here. I, I really like the approach that they have, but I'm also following the approach of Gibraltar that talks uh, a little bit more out of the box, saying that uh, it's, uh, we need new definitions. We don't try to squeeze everything into the old definition. So I also like this approach. But I think Switzerland is more flexible and it can adapt to uh, the development of the technology. And I think this is an excellent event with uh, amazing people working in, in Switzerland in different applications. And we've, of course, had quite a flurry in ICOs, initial coin offerings here. Uh, tell me what your thoughts on ICOs. Is it really like the future to fund a new company? Is that the way forward? Well, actually, the ICOs, there, there is a big hype. I'm not sure it's uh, still there, but um, actually it's a very interesting tool for crowdfunding. And we don't have a harmonized market in Europe. So I think Switzerland also can be faster there and regulate faster and smarter. But uh, of course it would help since the banks are overregulated to give uh, funding, risky funding to SMEs. ICOs can be um, a tool to get funding immediately. And as a security or not, it doesn't matter. But you can get funding to start your idea or you can get funding to uh, expand your idea. You can give equity or not. Still, the potential is great because you can do everything on your phone. You don't even actually need a bank. And this makes everything much easier, especially if you're a small company or a small startup and you need to explore and you need to find open-minded people. It helps you, giving you an environment and a tool that is really useful. Could blockchain replace banks one day, do you think? Well, I would dare to say that it would replace a big part of the banking sector. Uh, but I wouldn't say we will not need banks. You know why? Because many people prefer and they like the traditional system or they don't like innovation up to the point that they will do everything on their phone. They like to have intermediaries. Um, so it's like when we have the ATMs. The ATMs did not uh, shut down the banks. We have people explaining to people, to citizens, how the ATMs work. So I do believe we're going to have banks. <laughs> And in terms of going back to the learning point and ch children, surely we should be teaching our children to program. It's as important, if not more important, than learning languages, would you say? 
I would say that coding is a global language and it would be really useful for our children to learn this language. I can also tell you that digital skills for us is essential in the European Parliament because if you don't have digital skills, you don't have access to services and opportunities um, to change your job because you know that with artificial intelligence, a lot of jobs, the nature of a lot of jobs will change. So actually, I think having digital skills will help you always stay in the best side without uh, being discriminated or without being in the uh, opposite side of like uh, increasing the gap of inequalities, you can be on the best side. Our job there is to make sure that people will have the option and free access to education and uh, to acquire digital skills. Now I'm going to shift gear a little bit. I want to find out a little bit about your work as a, a member of the European Parliament. Blockchain is clearly your passion. It's part of what you do. It's not the only thing you do. Um, what else would you say are the most pressing, pressing issues for the European Parliament, maybe the top three at this point in time? Uh, well, uh, we were trying to work on the banking union. So that was one of our main problems, to have capital markets union. We try to have uh, guarantees for our deposits in the European level so that we are a stronger union. And also to work on common taxation or harmonised taxation, because this would also reduce inequalities. So I think one big part of our job is that. The second is to create growth in uh, using innovation in the traditional industry, but exploring also new potential with innovation. And... If I can say, besides everything else I could mention, like energy or uh, migration, I can tell you that for me it's important that we started working on the ethics of the governance of data, which is the fuel for artificial intelligence and everything we've been talking about. Where do you think the, the parliament is failing? Well, I think we are not as fast as we should, because we saw what happened uh, with the Cambridge Analytica case, and uh, still we have GDPR, so uh, Europe is leading. By that, do you mean with what happened with Facebook yes. and privacy, data privacy? Actually, it, I wouldn't even say it's a, it's a matter of privacy. It's the manipulation of the news feed or of knowledge or of data to change your perception. So uh, there we don't have enough protection for our citizens and we have to create transparent algorithms, transparent rules, so that everybody would understand how their data are being used. And also, if somebody's making money using your data, you should be rewarded for that. Or you should at least know that, and you have to consent to give away your data. Uh, Switzerland isn't part of Europe, but how do you view, how does the Parliament view Switzerland, given that it's in the heart of Europe, but it's not? Well, we wanted Switzerland in Europe. And the Swiss people decided to take some time, I think. I do hope they will reconsider. Uh, but uh, we have, it's one of the countries we are working very closely. And um, I do believe that we have a lot to learn. So, from Switzerland yes, or from, from each Switzerland. other? from Switzerland. And I think we can... Uh, what sort of things could you learn? Well, for example, you have a system, uh, an electoral system that's working. You have the referendums where people participate more. We don't have that in Europe, actually. So you educate your citizens in many different things so that they can make decisions. Uh, this, this is a process that can take years to happen in Europe. So I think we have a lot to learn of the mentality and the culture of the people here. And fundamentally, is that what went wrong for, for Britain and Brexit? That could be the case. I wouldn't say this is the only thing. But I can tell you that um, misinformation or negative uh, news about Europe could be, um, could be one of the problems. So, uh, maybe migration was uh, you know, one of the problems. But I think the perception for migration was even worse. And how can that be changed in the future? Well, I think if politicians show pe to people, to citizens, that they are controlling by policies the borders, they're protecting their citizens, they have safety nets and they, they can run fast to regulate what they have to regulate but not to overdo it. So, for example, as I said before, the banking union, it's essential to be able to provide SMEs with liquidity because if you, you don't do that, people, um, brain drain will happen, they will move to US, they will go to different countries where they can develop their businesses, they can get uh, easy, easy access to, to money, actually. Um, I think this is also the, uh, what we could have won from UK. We could have worked better with them in this, in the financial sector. 
I think it will mature all of us. And uh, the future of the EU, is there a country that's uh, ready to go next? Your country, for example? Well, I don't think uh, we have countries that want to exit. But what I can see is that we're going to have countries, we, uh, different countries that want to move on faster than the others, that want, not that can. The countries that want to move faster, uh, we will try to make it work faster. So I think this would be uh, important for Europe to, to move forward without delays. Is it possible for all these countries to be somehow together, but yet at so many different um, stages of many different things, be it infrastructure or economy or jobs or... Welcome to our world. This is what we're fighting with uh, every day. This is what we're trying to achieve. We try to gap these differences and we try to reduce that. Uh, but I can tell you, even in the US, you have uh, the difference between south and north, uh, east and west. This happens everywhere, even in one country itself, in one member Perhaps state. Perhaps the cultures aren't so diverse, but I get your point. And, and speaking of the US, what, uh, what comes from the US across your desk? Is protectionism something that's widely spoken about within Parliament? I could tell you, I usually say that, I know it sounds a bit weird, but I think what happened to US, uh, the new president, helped a lot Europe. And it was maybe the best thing that would happen to us because we ran very fast to manage to be autonomous in different things. And I think this is important. So we try to work more on integrating policies and trying to work better with us and decide to have common unions like energy union, a, single, a digital single market. And instead of postponing that all the time, we try to remove obstacles and barriers among us uh, much faster. Just one quick question on Switzerland again. You have no fear that there's any um, relationship crisis there between Europe and Switzerland? Uh, not from what I know of. Uh, but, you know, I don't take anything for granted. Even inside the EU, you know, we have electoral results that they are challenging and that we have to understand the message that citizens are sending and we have to adapt into a modern, modern responses, political responses. So we have to have a clear message. We have to work uh, fast and a lot. I'm working in several files and I see that uh, it's never enough because things are happening also very fast around you and you have to be a global player into, as I said, AI will transform everything. And we have, before we, uh, we reach in the banking union, we have already to start reconsidering um, the new tax system, um, taking under consideration the virtual currencies, or seeing how a cashless society could, be, uh, could work out without cash. So there are many things we should try to understand. Minimum wage, minimum income. These are discussions that we have in, in Europe. Uh, we have to provide, um, we talk about the digital tax, how this can be redistributed through a minimum income, for example. So you understand we, we have to give responses that we didn't, uh, we had more time, but we didn't do that earlier. How is it to be a woman in Parliament, Eva? Ah, I, it's exciting. And I have to tell you that the fight to have more women in politics has been working. I see already in many forums and discussions a lot of women taking important positions and uh, uh, working Still on legislation. Still not enough uh, women in technology, though, for example. How can what's worked for Parliament then be sort of transferred well, to technology? Our commissioner is a woman, actually, for, the, for digital, Maria Gabriel, and uh, she's a young woman. So yesterday we had a digital day in the European Parliament. We had more women than men. So what we have to do and what we started even as pilot is uh, teaching uh, girls how to code, trying to give them the tools to enter this new, um, new technology, because with that you can even work from home. So it can, um, it can be a solution for the difficult roles that women has to play, have to play. So we're doing a lot of things. We even talk about um, reducing the gap between the salaries up to zero. We are trying to challenge companies to have always women on the boards. Did you ever have any challenges as a woman? I had a lot since I was, <laughs> I was young. Um, and that's why I think I talk from experience, um, because you have to prove more than men do. I think you face the same problems. We cannot talk about it very often, but the stereotypes are there and the mentalities are hard to fight. It, takes generations to change, to change. But I think there are women like you that they are 
opening the road to other women and they are fighting uh, uh, for their job, in their job, and I think working harder than men sometimes to prove that they should not be doubted. Stay with us, lots more still to come on the programme, including a roundup of all the main financial news from this week. Don't go away. Welcome back to the programme. It's been all about currencies this week as we look at what a weakening Swiss franc means for the economy. Earlier, I spoke to Costa Viennas, senior consultant at Willer Schoff & Partners, to find out what a strengthening euro means for us here in Switzerland. I think it's, it's useful to get a sense of where the Swiss franc should trade in terms of its purchasing power parity, and that's around one Swiss franc 22 against the euro. Mm -hmm. um, we're very close to that. So that would place the currency in fair value. Um, against the dollar, it should be 95 US cents against the Swiss franc. Today we were at 98, so we're very close to that. So... Um, Do you think we'll see it continuing to weaken? Uh, against the euro, probably yes, for the simple reason that uh, Europe is doing relatively well, um, and probably yes. And what does that mean in terms of everyday life here in Switzerland? Well, um, it means that uh, imported goods uh, become more expensive. The currency is weakened by 10% against the euro over the past year. Um, and you can already see that in terms of inflation. Mm -hmm. Import inflation is up 2% year on year. Uh, and he also was saying that, you know, any tightening of the monetary policy would be too early at, at this juncture. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, the view I would take is that central banks typically have to be data dependent. Uh, they look at the same numbers that we do. Mm -hmm. um, the most recent economic growth numbers... So, you have to understand, the Swiss economy can potentially grow at around 1.5%. Mm -hmm. That's potential growth. Uh, it's now growing uh, at around 2% um, or more. So, it's growing above potential and that would be unusual to leave interest rates where they are now. So you think he could change his mind? Oh, yes, at any time. Uh, what, in, in the next weeks, do you think? Or, no, no, I no, mean, no. Most people no, that we saying. speak to are just saying that, you know, the, the SMB aren't going to do very much before the ECB does. Um, that may or may not happen. Um, if you've seen the currency weaken by 10% over the past year, uh, if the currency were to weaken by a lot more unexpectedly, um, the central bank would have to reassess. So the SMB is data dependent. In a growing economy, things have to change. How long do you think we could see negative interest rates? Um, well, that's difficult to say. Um, one of the key measures is to look at inflation. Inflation is just below 1%. Um, so at this pace, they still have time to wait. Um, but I wouldn't want to, you know, put a specific date on it because I couldn't possibly mm. predict that. All right, let me put this to you then. The US Treasury mentioned that Switzerland uh, could be a possible currency manipulator. What do you make of that? Yeah, so the, 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 the US Treasury uh, was instructed by Congress uh, to monitor uh, various countries. Switzerland is on that list because uh, it has a very large current account uh, surplus and because uh, reserves have built up very significantly. So this, in a way, ties the central bank's hands um, in the sense that it shouldn't be intervening excessively uh, if it doesn't want to attract attention. So it's something, it's something worth watching. Do you think that the SMB is uh, transparent enough? Um, we don't get sufficient data fast enough in some cases. Mm -hmm. Um, it takes some time to do that, um, but I think on the whole, yes. I'm just wondering if, you know, the, the United States has a point, you know, could we be uh, more yes. open? So, so in the last, in the last uh, US Treasury report, they specifically stated that they would appreciate uh, the Swiss National Bank uh, releasing more information earlier. 
Uh, we talked about the ECB very briefly a minute yeah. ago. Let's kind of broaden out our discussion to in involve the rest of Europe. Mario Draghi saying that, you know, he's going to keep his policies the same. Were you surprised by that? Um, no, because what he was doing, he was describing data that we had seen. So as I mentioned, we typically have similar data. Mm. He described um, the, the first quarter numbers that we saw in Europe were weaker. Um, so he merely repeated what, what was observable, and therefore that was not too much of a surprise. Sometimes the markets try to read a, a huge amount into a particular uh, comment, mm -hmm. um, and I'd say that's not always useful. So for example, today we had um, data out of Europe showing that April, uh, April uh, sentiment indicators had moved sideways, mm -hmm. better than the information that Draghi had earlier in the week. So I wouldn't read too much uh, into some of those statements. Do you think the European economy will slow? So the European, I think it's worth knowing what Europe, Europe Eurozone's potential growth rate uh, is around 1.1%. Um, it's currently growing at somewhere around two and a half to three. So Europe is growing way above its potential um, and therefore, it's not unexpected to see a bit of weakness, a bit of slowdown, but it's still, these are still good numbers. Anywhere in particular in Europe that we might see more of a slowdown? Um, well, the expectation would be that you might see more of this uh, uh, in, in Germany, but these would be shorter term fluctuations. The general, the general numbers that we have, the outlook that we have, suggest that Europe is doing relatively well. Okay. And, and the recent slowdown should not be over-exaggerated. Let's uh, go out even further now. Let's involve the United States. Um, the picture there is very different. GDP today shows a slowdown, however. Uh, what happened? Um, so again, I, I think it's worth knowing growth relative to what. So uh, we estimate the potential growth uh, possibility for the US economy around 1.9%. That's mm -hmm. the potential for the economy. Um, and today, annualized growth was around 2.4. If you look at year-on-year -year numbers, it was 2.9. So the US is doing extremely well relative to what it can do. Um, and again, um, I know the market's sort of focused on annualized, an annualized decline um, this quarter with the previous quarter. But if you look at year-on-year -year numbers, it still looks pretty good. And I mean, are there any challenges that come with with an economy that's doing better than expected? Yes, so the first, the first is uh, you begin running out of people, um, and that's what we have in... Uh, there are more and more news reports uh, about um, uh, companies, regions, looking for, uh, for workers in certain categories. Mm -hmm. um, that's a nice problem to have. Um, well, quite oh, a serious problem when you're kind of focusing on regenerating business at home. Yes, but um, you know there are things that can be done with that. That's a nice problem to have. Um, and the other, the other problem would be inflation. Um, inflation in the U.S. is around two and a half percent. So um, over time, inflation is likely to pick up. Then, if you if you have an economy that's growing well above potential, and of course the other the other challenge is you know you cannot grow sustainably above what your potential is. So you get closer to the next recession. And how do kind of these inflation worries and the slowdown, how do they go together? So, um, well, the, typically what happens and what has happened in the past is inflation has always kind of triggered the central bank to raise rates mm -hmm. uh, and trigger a recession. Um, that may or may not happen this time. But I think that inflation is obviously something that we have to watch for it very closely. Are we in uncharted territory, really, with kind of how things are developing in the United States, or...? Well, we in uncharted territory in terms of debt. Mm -hmm. The US has never had as much debt, uh, government debt, as it has now. It has debt to GDP, similar levels to the Second World War. So that's uncharted. Um, what is also uncharted is that you have this late in the cycle, um, huge deficits, um, tax cuts. We like ta tax cuts, um, but they've got to be paid for at some point. So that is unusual. Okay. 
Well, well, we've run out of time. Uh, Costa Vayanas, thank you very much thank indeed you. for joining us. Thank you. Well, tech stocks certainly saw a rebound this week, though markets didn't quite reflect the news as expected. Earlier, I spoke with Roberto Magnantantini from CIS Management. Let's talk tech, Amazon and Facebook. Quite the turnaround. Yeah, well, we cannot really say that it's a turnaround because they really never left the party. I mean, uh, the, those companies have been in the driving seat of the bull market over the last two years. And uh, we can find negatives to the tech story, but for sure, earnings have been really quite impressive. Today's results at Amazon are really best of breed. You can consider that it's a company that is very close to $800 billion uh, market capitalization. So it's, it dwarfs entire countries like, well, Italy, or uh, Spain, or even Russia, probably today. So we have this type of very large company, and it's growing at a rate that could have even blush out of pride startups. So it's really, it's not out of uh, of the blue that these companies uh, are performing so well. So I was going to these... ask you, I mean, what is the mood like then for tech stocks? I guess they it never really dipped at all. Yeah, we, we had this, this issue with Facebook. We had this uh, data leak at Facebook. It was probably a little bit of the, the first serious scare uh, of these bull markets because, as we said, earnings are, are good. So the, the big question for technology probably today is, is it too good to last? So do we have to, to fear uh, regulation, for example, or increased taxation? And Facebook gives us a, a, a hint of the risk that we could face. But uh, yeah, I agree. We uh, should, and you think it is going to, I mean, how long is it going to last? I would love to answer that. <laughs> but uh, now, what, what is true is that today, today we have companies that have become almost natural monopolies. And because of that, even if they have created massive wealth and, and uh, also uh, almost for free added services to the people, we have companies that have very few employees. Maybe Amazon is a little bit the exception, but uh, Facebook is something like 20,000 employees and they generate billions in profits and they do not pay that much in terms of taxes. So it, it's relatively easy to consider that they could attract uh, yeah, stronger regulation, tougher regulation, and that could be the first serious test of the of the bull market. Because all right, well, with, all with, all, with all this po positivity about uh, surrounding tech stocks, you know, how come then that U.S. stocks, you know, have been struggling? Yeah, well, they've been struggling after a, a massive run. So we shouldn't forget w where we're coming from. The U.S. over the last couple of years, the S&P went up roughly 40, 50 percent, uh, almost unabated. We had very few corrections. So probably we had, uh, yeah, we, we were at a state where some complacency was built in the system, and you were poised to have a correction. So we had the situation when earnings were very strong, economics were relatively strong, but you had interest rates going up, and interest rates, um, yeah, they act very much like a sort of gravitational force for the markets. So you have to do even better. Uh, than you, what you were doing with lower rates just to stand still. And even if we do not think there is a, a bubble in technology stocks, they are quite expensive. The FANGs and e-commerce stocks, they are quite expensive. They, they are long duration stocks, so they're very sensitive to interest rates. Let's talk about bond yields then for a moment. They're currently sitting around 3%. Uh, this is one reason perhaps investors aren't going into uh, market. So how do you see that bond situation developing? Yeah, no, that's definitely something that we, we watch very closely. There are two situations. If interest rates go up because the economics are improving faster than what was initially expected, it's a relatively benign scenario. The situation today is probably a bit more worrying because we have these interest rates going up. We went from 2.5 to 3 since the beginning of the year for the 10-year uh, US uh, bond. And probably with economics that are a little bit on the weakish side, so... We, there is this fear that it's more the quantitative easing receding than really the strength in the economy. So, yeah, we personally think that it's quite unlikely that we go much higher than 3% in the short term. You think we'll it's reach 3.5%? That's what we're hearing. 
technique, everybody's looking at the same technical levels, and uh, that's a level that is quite obvious. So there may be some self-fulfilling uh, into that, but we would be quite surprised because bottoming processes take years. They are not as fast as that to, uh, to happen. And again, the strength in the economy is not, uh, is not sufficient probably today to do much above 3, 2, 3, 3, something like that. We saw today the economic numbers weren't as impressive today. Again. Okay, let's just uh, quickly move on to Europe. We're running out of time, but you know the strengthening euro is also posing problems here. Who are? What are some of the companies that uh, are being hardest hit? Companies that have the highest, um, yeah, that, okay, co companies that have only translation risk, meaning that they they have a cost base that is matching the revenue base, are relatively sheltered. Those that are more exposed are ones that produce in Europe and export directly everything into uh, into other currency. Clearly, here you have transactional cost. It's it's more an issue. But we have Switzerland, we have Germany as examples. Companies tend to adapt quite well in the long run. So strong a strong currency for a country and even for a company in the long run is not such a big issue. If you are in a low added value uh, industry, clearly that's more a problem. OK, well, we'll leave it there, uh, Mr. Manian Tantini. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on CNN Money Switzerland. And finally tonight, ABBA is getting the band back together. The Swedish pop group announced today on its official Instagram account that an earlier announced avatar tour of the band dubbed Avatars helped rekindle the magic. The group disbanded back in 1982. In 2016, though, there was a reunion of sorts in Stockholm for the opening of a restaurant by one of the original band members. Now, the eatery was based on the Greek tavern featured in Mamma Mia! the Broadway musical he helped create, based around ABBA songs. And he gave CNN a guided tour a few years ago. It took years. It took two and a half to three years, I think, mm. uh, from when the idea was first born till the opening. <laughs> this venue, there's a big party going on every night. Mama Mia. A party inspired by the runaway success of Mamma Mia! the musical, which in turn was inspired by ABBA one of the most successful bands of all time. At the end of each performance, people stand up and sing and, and, and dance in the aisles, and there's like a party mood. And I always had the feeling that if people uh, could have gone on to some other place and have a party, they would. And that's exactly the idea behind Mamma Mia! The Party, a Greek-style restaurant launched just this January and able to host about 450 people each night, lured in by the unique mix of food and performances. We thought it would be nice to have a little story played out in real time every, every evening while people are eating and drinking and having fun through dialogue and through ABBA songs. Something that appears to be keeping the Swedish pop group in the limelight even decades after their split. The band recently reunited on stage for the launch of Mamma Mia! The Party, their first joint appearance in years. It took a split second and then it felt so familiar, you know, standing there with those other three people with whom I've been standing on so many stages around the world. Like this winning performance of Waterloo at the Eurovision Song Contest in 1974. Stockholm set to host the annual singing competition in May, and Björn plans to launch Mamma Mia! The Party in English around the same time, taking him one step closer to his next dream. It's like this show was made for, for New York, I think. And Mamma Mia! ran there on Broadway for 14 years. I want to go back, and, and to have a show there is amazing. Well, that's it from us here on the Swiss Pulse this evening. We'll be back on Monday. Have a great weekend. And remember, you can catch everything on our website, cnnmoney.ch. Bye-bye.